Los Angeles. Sunshine, shadows, and smog. Street lights and broken glass. Where dreams are made and lambs slaughtered. Koreatown, Little Armenia, the Rolling Twenties. City of Angels, Hustlers, Dodgers, Fast Women, and Naked Ambition. Hillsides and crashing waves, convertibles and cockroaches. Kissed by God, awaiting his vengeance. And every corner immortalized by the movies. Okay, so last episode, Mason. Yes. You asked me what the last superhero movie I saw was. Yes. The superhero movie I've seen most recently. Probably the greatest superhero film ever produced in the history of films. That is, I'm so glad to hear that. So, what did you think of Endgame? <laughs> that is what you're talking no, about, no, right? I'm talking about a film that, you know, like nowadays, a film that they stack up two villains. Or the most recent Batman movie, they had right. Catwoman, Penguin, and the Riddler. Oh, I see. No, no. End, yeah, I see where this is going. I see where this is going. So, you finally saw Spider-Man No Way Home. No. What I watched is... From the sewers of Gotham, a new villain emerges. From the rooftops of Gotham, the perfect enemy comes to life. Holy superlatives, Batman! It's really exciting. Soon, very soon, Batman and I will be batapulting right out of your TV sets and onto your theater screens. That's right, Robin. Our first full-length motion picture feature in color opens a whole new world of thrills. Batman the Movie from 1966, which prominently featured not just the Riddler, though it did, it had the Penguin, Catwoman and the Joker all throughout the film and Robin. I, I take issue with the description that this is a superhero film. <laughs> <laughs> you don't you don't consider this a superhero film? No. It was released in nineteen sixty-six. It's rated PG now. I'm not sure they had a PG rating in nineteen sixty-six, but yeah. it's been reevaluated as as PG. And stars Adam West, yes. Burt Ward. Uh, Cesar Romero, Burgess Meredith, Frank Gorshin, and Lee Merriweather. Yes. In a surprise. Not Julie Newmar. And not Eartha Kitt. And not Eartha Kitt. I had not seen this before. I have seen a couple episodes of, of the Batman TV series, of course. Now, was this filmed before the TV series? No. This was made after season one was a massive hit on TV, and I think the idea was probably that they would make more films after this. And okay. I don't know why a second one wasn't made after this. I do know with the TV show that it continued to be a hit through season two, and the plan was to spin it off into a Batgirl TV show and have two Batman shows. And so they brought in Batgirl in season three as Commissioner Gordon's daughter, Barbara Gordon. The pu public was fickle, and they got tired of the Batman TV show. So not only was there never a Batgirl show, there was no season four of Batman and no no other Batman movies. So we have a He-Man and She-Ra situation going yes. on. Was the, the Batgirl that came in in season three because I haven't watched anything I think from after maybe season one of the show was that Yvonne Craig do I remember that correctly I think you're right although not having ever watched it I still know you know it's it's nerd culture enough that I, <laughs> I, I, I've seen some things about it even though I've never seen much of the show. I've seen every episode. Some things the show is notable for, one, popularizing the Riddler. Frank Gorshin was the first villain on the show in its pilot episode. It was originally, if you've ever seen the show, you know that they uh, we probably should have ended the last show, Old Chum, by giving some kind of uh, cliffhanger. Yes. The plan was that the show was going to be a one-hour show, and then at some point they decided, no, let's do this as two episodes before ever releasing it, because the first two episodes have the cliffhanger. Yeah, well, comedies very rarely work at hour length, so that doesn't, yes. on TV anyway, so that doesn't surprise me. And that's what I remember Batman the TV series for. It is when did you see it? Campy. Oh, I saw, I saw at least one episode in college. Okay. I may have seen more. 
And I've seen the odd one over the years. I saw one in Dallas at a friend's house. I think he showed us the pilot episode. Which does he do the Batusi? That the is pilot? from the pilot. Okay, so yeah, that's 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 one I I know I've seen for sure. Yeah, all over the place really. This was the first Batman I was introduced to, except for maybe around the same time, a couple of animated things with Batman in the early to mid 80s. But I would watch this in the early to mid 1980s syndicated, the Batman television show and this movie. I must have had a beta tape off of this movie from TV that I watched a trillion times until I watched the episodes again as an adult. I had no idea it was a comedy. And in fact, it took me a few episodes of watching the show and being like, do they know, are they trying to be funny? And they are, it's a, it's a sitcom that's meant for the whole family. The movie now, watching this movie, it's very apparent they know it's a comedy from the start with the, with the opening credit things where they talk about who, what kind of people the movie mm -hmm. is for mm -hmm. with that text and the, mm -hmm. Spotlight. And so trying. lovers of this, lovers of that. And then lovers of all kinds, yes. Mm. They did so many wacky things on the show, like there's an episode where Liberace plays twins. Every woman in town is just like in love with this Liberace character who's a pianist. They changed Mr. Zero to Mr. Freeze, so we know Mr. Freeze today based on this. It was a big deal, I guess, this show, and the actors, especially the villains, they went all out, and the main performers tried their best until, I think as the show wore on to season three, There's you get especially um, Neil Hamilton starts to... Maybe he, he feels that he has his own show coming with Batgirl and seems to not play the character as straight or, or do as good of a job. I adore this show and this movie. Yeah, how did you feel about it? Uh, honestly, it left me a little cold. <laughs> this is, I, am, I am very rarely a fan of the... Uh, we know it's bad, so we're going to try to camp it. I mean, the occasional one will slip through the cracks that hits me in just the right way, like a Sharknado. I don't um, think they were trying to be bad. No, I think they were trying to be campy. I think they were trying to somehow ride the line between giving the kids their adventure and having jokes for the adults. I think they were trying to be in some kind of... I've never watched some SpongeBob SquarePants, but I'm thinking that they were going for something like whatever that show is. This is a show perhaps inspired by Get Smart and yep. James Bond in equal measure. See, now, Get Smart is one of those things that, that does hit me right, but uh, SpongeBob, I've seen a few episodes and I hate... Sp I've never seen either. I'm just kind of speculating... <laughs> Yeah. And that's what they're going for. I don't think there was any attempt to make it bad or cheesy. I think they were somehow trying to make knowing, sophisticated jokes or silly 60s humor within the framework of making a show for kids and mm. instead of making it for the whole family in prime time. I just don't think any of the jokes are sophisticated. <laughs> but No, they're uh, not. No. However... <laughs> I enjoy many of them, like just the labeling of everything in the Batcave. The fact that... <laughs> I did laugh at that. That Bruce and um, Dick's r respective poles are labeled, labeled for who they are. Yes, because you couldn't just And take it says it. poles to the Batcave. Well, now, to be fair, uh, there is a costume lever on the way down that you can pull yes. and instantly get changed into your costume. You can only imagine how embarrassed you would be if you took the wrong pole and got dressed in the wrong costume. Yes. So that I get, but the poles to the bat cave label that's right over both poles, if someone were to accidentally discover that... Uh, that's what's so great, yeah. This is that they'd immediately like, know where they were going yeah. and who they were. Yes, it's a, it's a terrible idea. This iteration of Batman is not trying very hard to keep his secret. <laughs> no one can figure out, of course, that Bruce Wayne is Batman. No. No matter how obvious it is, and Batman cannot figure out that Miss Kitka in this, the Russian journalist, is actually Catwoman. Wait, Miss Kitka was Catwoman? <laughs> yes, she was. I couldn't have gotten that from the name. They really slapped you around the face with that halibut. <laughs> and the reason I picked this movie, it just reminded me that the show took place in L.A. and would use L.A. locations when we were watching Colors. Because Colors drives by the Woolworths building downtown. 
cab. I remember one of the early Batman episodes. They park in front of the Woolworths building and it's supposed to be downtown Gotham. And so in this movie, LA plays Gotham as it did on the television show, which also strikes me as funny because we don't think of Los Angeles as Gotham. No, uh, it literally exactly the opposite, right? Mm -hmm. um, because Gotham is on the East Coast. Yeah, and is clearly New York City. Yes, except for so many other people have made it other cities like Pittsburgh and Chicago and whatever city they can film in. I, I remember seeing some fictional map at one point that said that, you know, Metropolis was in Maryland or something and Gotham was in Delaware, right across the bay from each other. Something like that. I don't, I, I didn't pay much attention. Yeah, I mean, it, it, clearly it's meant to be New York City, like the darker side of New York. City. Casting Los Angeles, of all cities, yes. is almost the worst possible choice you could make while staying inside the continental United States. Yes. <laughs> yeah, and then the show's, even the theme song that we, is probably still the most famous Batman theme, is the na 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 na, -na Batman, is a very, like, surf jazz kind of uh, tune and the whole soundtrack for the show is kind of surf jazz and then on top of that the show is just so colorful and mm. wacky it, it really does not project what we think of as a batman film today no and batman's costume of course the iconic uh mostly gray costume with the with the black face piece and then like what seemed like a really dark purple fabric around the I'm thinking the that the face piece is also a bluish purple thing. It is purple. I think on my on old TV in the 80s it read as blue. On whatever files I have of the TV show, somebody has way oversaturated the color. They're incredibly purple. Mm -hmm. Also, Julie Newmar's teeth and the ones where she's Catwoman are incredibly yellow. Mm. And this is distractingly so. Well, you know, hygiene standards change over the decades. So quick synopsis without many spoilers in this. Yes. Batman and Robin get called into action right at the beginning to investigate something at sea. There's like a hijacking of a boat run by a uh, Commodore Schmidlap played by <laughs> uh, oh. Reg Reginald Denny. Oh, what a name. And they go, and instead of encountering the boat they're looking for, they end up with having to battle a shark that has been fed dynamite. Yes. The shark, in one of the multiple times in this movie where a sea animal dies needlessly, is uh, explodes after Batman beats it off his leg. And then they use clues from this crime to deduce who the villains are. Yes. What did you think about these clues they were given? Um, it takes place in the sea. Yes, and that is the worst clue because cats hate water. The cat starts with C. That's how they figure it out. All that did was make me wish I was watching that one episode of Blackadder where where, where, where Blackadder makes the same joke to Baldrick. Oh, really? Uh, or where Baldrick has... Yeah, um, it, you've never seen Black Adder. No. Okay. Is that the show with John Cleese? No, it's uh, Rowan Atkinson. Ah. And uh, it's a ep season three episode where Dr. Samuel Johnson comes to visit, and he's Whoa. brought his he's brought his dictionary, but they th they they throw it on the fire accidentally, and so they have one night to try and reconstruct ten years of the work of the greatest man of letters in English history. And so naturally, Blackadder's stupid idiot servant, Baldrick, decides to take the letter C for himself. And his definition is a big blue wobbly thing that fish live in. All, all that joke did was make me wish I was watching Blackadder. The Riddler joke was also, oh, this, this, this movie. <laughs> <laughs> what they try to do is figure out which supervillains, before they piece it together, are on the loose at present. And they are given in uh, Commissioner Gordon's office Yes, pictures of these people all in front of some kind of a uh, theater curtain. <laughs> yes. And mysteriously, there are four, and only four, super criminals currently at large in Gotham. And by a strange twist of fate... They all, every single one of them, happens to be involved in this particular caper. Is the Joker, as played by Cesar Romero. Yep. 
Uh, Burgess Meredith's Penguin. Yes. God bless Burgess Meredith. Yes. It's always nice to see him even in something like this. Frank and Gorshin's good. Riddler, and as usual, Frank Gorshin cannot stop acting. No. He, 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 he gave it his everything. There's a shot of him looking through a periscope in their submarine where he, he can't use his face because it's behind the thing, but he... He makes his tongue act. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh. And, and then, uh, of course, we said Lee Merriweather, as, who is by far the least famous of these three, four people as well, she, woman. She spent the least time in the role, didn't she? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there were three cat women, if I remember yes, correctly. she was new for the movie. Yes. For whatever reason, Julie Newmar couldn't do the movie. Did she do a single episode of the TV Eventually, show? Eventually, I think in season two, she did a two-episode Catwoman arc. Okay. Perhaps but, even directed by the director of this movie, Leslie H. Martinson, who did a very few episodes of the show. The show is created by William Dozier and Lorenzo Simple Jr. And if you look up the credits of Lorenzo Simple Jr. Yeah, why does that name sound familiar? He's the man who wrote such films as The Parallax View and Three Days of the Condor. Oh, three, that was him? Yes. Oh, okay. Well, that's not too bad. He probably made a mint off of this. Oh, and this is why I know him. His credits. <laughs> I see the 70s King Kong, the one with oh, Jessica wow. Lange. Wow. And the not James Bond movie, Never Say Never Again. Oh, wow. Starring Sean Connery as not James Bond, who still goes by James Bond. And we also get Madge Blake in this movie, as she's usually on the show, as Bruce Wayne's aunt. Burt Ward as his ward, his boy ward, the boy wonder himself. His, his boy Burt Ward. Dick Grayson, yes. Alan Napier as Alfred, and of course Stafford Rep as uh, Chief O'Hara, the incredibly ineffectual, incredibly Irish chief of police. Yes. And those are sort of the major players from the movie and the show in general. The only addition really is uh, Reginald Denny as, uh, as Commodore Schmedlap. Clearly, I mean, this was his story. This was his plot. Yes. And he was never going to show up again anyway, so that's fine. Yes, and he's barely in the movie. Yeah, um, that's true. He's in, what, for, you know, right at the beginning for a scene, and then... He shows up a few times throughout. Yeah, a couple times toward the end, and that's about and it. And the running gag is that he doesn't have any idea what's going on. Not to spoil it, but I think another actor might spend more time as his character than he does. Yes. <laughs> so what Batman determines is that now any two of these guys might still be trying to take over Gotham. Yes. And any three might be trying to take over the United States. Naturally. I mean, it, it is only a one supervillain step up from Gotham City to the entire United but States. But the four of these criminal masterminds together... Their goal can only be to take over the entire world. Yes. That is the kind of math that makes exactly the amount of sense I would expect it to make. Their means of doing <laughs> this are somehow stealing something that was aboard Curtis Commodore Schmidlap's ship and hiding Commodore Schmidlap in their own coastal hideout, which is like the oldie Benbow Tavern. Benbow Tavern. Yes. Is that a real location? I don't think so. I think they've invented the name. Those scenes were shot in Santa Barbara. Well, I, yeah, I, yeah. I knew the interior. The interior is obviously a soundstage. Yes. Um, Most of the interiors in this obviously are sound stages. Some yeah. of them, I think, may have been repeated from the television show, but redressed. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me one bit. Uh, or if they could get like three hours on someone else's set, just some for some variety. But I was wondering if that building was, was anything. Yeah, it probably is something in, we, I, I didn't, I looked up where they shot it and then when it wasn't in LA, I didn't do further mm -hmm. research. Santa Barbara is a city about an hour, 45 minutes north of Los Angeles, which recently Fran Lebowitz described as making Beverly Hills look like Detroit. <laughs> Santa Barbara is a nice place. The wow. weather is great. It's there's a lot of money. Well, it can't be that nice a place. I mean, you have people running around in unitards trying to take over the world with yes. 
Polaris missiles. Yes. Uh, so I, I question, Fran Leibowitz, I question your assertion about how nice a place Santa Barbara can be if they just let Frank Gorshin walk around the streets unmolested. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Frank Gorshin in general is not usually a mark of uh, you've got high standards in your community. <laughs> <laughs> He's really going to take a pummeling in this one, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> What's funny is his character in this seems to rankle the most at like having to deal with the other criminals, but also his performance seems to rankle the most at having to deal with co-stars. That is one of the things I like the most about this movie. I'm not a Batman comics guy. I'm not a comics guy in general. I've described myself as comics adjacent in that I will watch adaptations and I will play video games and I will do the research to see what came from the comics and how it was adapted, but I don't ever really go back and read the source material. Having said that, it's always been my impression from the Batman ancillaries I've consumed that most of the people in Batman's rogues gallery do not play well with each other when they have to team up, and they do not team up for long because eventually they will go after each other almost as much as they're going to go after Batman. Frank Gorshin is being the most realistic yes. and believable of these four villains in that he clearly would rather be doing anything else by himself. You know who seems to be having the most fun playing with others? Cesar Romero. Oh my gosh, he was fun though. Yeah, he, he's having a blast. Mm. And then Lee Merriweather I thought was quite good. Burgess Meredith often is the best of the Batman villains on the show and in this movie his, his acting is very solid. I'm tempted to say he's the one I overlooked the most and that's ironic because I think he gets more screen time. Yes, he's the leader. It's his henchmen who are always being used and it's clearly it's his, his hideout. Boat. It's his boat. One spoiler here, there's a sequence where the villains fly through the air at night on umbrellas that are like witches brooms jetpack umbrellas they ride on mm -hmm. and which is definitely a penguin thing yes but yeah i uh, caesar romero was fun i i would really like to go back to 1966 and watch this in the theater to see if the mustache that has clearly oh, been yes. painted over <laughs> is as apparent on a big screen using 60s projection technology as it was on my high def tv oh my yes room. absolutely yeah you can definitely tell this he's rocking the mustache yeah he, as he did on the television program. he never was if i've heard that right he didn't want to shave it off like, someone tried to persuade him to shave it off, and he just flat out refused, and so they just painted over it and that has to be the hoped truth. no one noticed. I mean, there's no way they wanted him to have it. Oh, because it looks, it's so distracting. It is. It, it's not noticeable in, lo in, in long shots, but when they, when they do a close-up on him. Today, they would just CG it off like Henry Cavill's. You know, it probably cost them more money to CG off Henry Cavill's mustache in one frame of that awful aborted Justice League movie, uh, it probably than it cost to make this whole movie. In the opening sequence, we get shown that this is a bigger deal than the TV show with a bigger budget. You mentioned that lever that changes their costumes as they slide down. That was never on the show. That's a, that was added for the movie. And then immediately they go to the Van Nuys Airport or the Gotham Airport and they get a bat copter after they pull out of the bat cave in the Batmobile. Yep. And they have, so now in this one, they have a helicopter, they have a bat boat. They have a bat cycle. And they have a bat cycle. But in this opening sequence where they fly around the helicopter, they go over like the Kirkaby Center where women in bikinis. Uh, yeah, I was, I was going to, to bring that up. The famous Kirkaby Center on Wilshire in downtown Gotham. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which it turns out I've been in because that's where the Hammer Museum is. Is it really? Based on Armand Hammer, yeah. Okay. The last time I was in L.A., I went with uh, my buddy to, uh, Jeremiah to see the movie Marlowe in, in that same area. And we accidentally made a wrong turn and tried to get into the parking lot. And we entered into this like private cemetery and it had Armand Hammer's crypt or mausoleum in it. 
Is Army Hammer's career there too? Speaking of tall people, like <laughs> Army Hammer, how much taller than everybody else Cesar Romero is. Yeah, he's huge. Yeah. What was Lee Merriweather like? Five eight? She's no slouch, no. and he still towers over everybody. The criminals. For whatever reason, before they enact their plan, think they need to get uh, Batman and Robin out of the way. Well, for obvious reasons, they don't want to be thwarted, so they're going to kill Batman and Robin. And their system is to use Catwoman undercover as Miss Kitka, a Russian journalist, Mm -hmm. to flatter Adam West into taking her on a date. Mm -hmm. And then they will kidnap Bruce Wayne, and that will lure Batman and Robin to try to save Bruce Wayne. Yes. And then once they kill Batman and Robin, they will enact their ultimate plan, which is to attack not the United Nation. No, the, what was it, the United World? Yes. And when we see the United World building, I believe we do get an exterior still yes. of the real United Nations building. But in, then when they actually go to it, it's a place in uh, Century City, the Boulevard of the Stars uh, building there. <laughs> Miss Kitka. Kitka is an acronym for five different Russian names, all of which escape me, and I'm not even no, going to try to... I can't to... remember either, but he's like, quite an amusing acronym. Yeah, I'm, I'm not going to try to recreate it, but she is, for some reason, at least this is her cover story, she's a reporter for the Moscow Bugle, who is in Gotham on assignment, I guess. May I just say, the idea... She At one point, she refers to the Riddler as a bourgeois. Yeah, she says these bourgeois supervillains that make prey on the the workers of Gotham. Yeah, listen, sweetheart, you're a (laughs) Soviet. The bourgeois guy is the guy whose mansion you're in. The guy you're taking out on a date. That is the most unrealistic thing in this movie. <laughs> she asks if he, he's a vigilante like the Lone Ranger, and they're very quick to point out that no, Batman and Robin are deputized. Fully deputized agents of the law. This that, would be one of the running jokes on the show is that Batman is never breaking any laws or rules. Yeah, that gives me such confidence in the GCPD of this universe this, that they need two guys dressed in circus costumes to go around fighting crime on their behalf. Oh, and they sure do. They they can never figure out anything on their own. No, they are. it, it is depressing how dumb they are. <laughs> so that's more or less... The plot we can reveal, I mean... Without going any further into it, yeah, I think so. What were some highlights to you of this movie? Freedom Bond! Top of the world! Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. This is our time! A race is like you're good, you know what I mean? You know how many times somebody told me I was good in my life? Two! Two, twice. This race today in dance and dance at the disco. This is the one. This is the one I'll be remembered for. Hey Matt, what has yellow skin and rights? <laughs> A ballpoint banana! No, that's wrong. The answer is Tom Wolf with jaundice. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously. I, I'm not sure if it was a highlight or a low light, or maybe given what we're watching both at the same time, but the the riddles, <laughs> I've not engaged with a lot of Riddler media except for the Rocksteady Arkham games, uh, where the Riddler is a major villain in every single one of those games. And in those games... When, when the Riddler gives you a riddle, the writing plays pretty fair. Mm. Like, it's an actual riddle, and you can figure it out, but in a couple of cases, you still may not be able to without, you know, giving it a few minutes of thought, or, well, a few seconds of thought, anyway. It's a video game. They want it. But there is no way that the correct answer to what has yellow skin and rights is a banana ballpoint. Ballpoint banana. Ballpoint banana, excuse me. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry I reversed the words. In this See, the way I said it, it was just obviously silly, but yes. your way is clearly genius. Sense. The Riddler puts out 
at least five riddles in this that they solve, and maybe two of them make sense. The, the, one the about only one that I got, and I did it as a joke, not thinking it would be the actual answer, was what does a turkey do yes. when he flies upside down or something like that? And I think it's fair to say that the answer is he gobbles up. This movie went further with making the riddles ridiculous. On the show, a lot of times you can figure them out. They've gone farther with the comedy of making the riddles, rid Riddler's riddles on this really out there okay that, they're just ridiculous that makes me feel better about the show one thing i did like was when you saw their collective hideout at yieldy bimbo tavern that they had a shelf of volumes of riddles that were the riddler's riddles and next to it they had the joker's jokes which were all like chinese finger trap style things i i did think it was but he had a lot of books of riddles i did think it was interesting that next to the riddle sign they also had a double question mark yes this is are these riddles <laughs> do you know one of the definite highlights for me and this may come down just solely to how she looks in the costuming, was Lee Merriweather. She's good in this, and she's hot, too. Yeah, I, that's the thing, is she's got to look good in the cat costume, but uh, when she's undercover, and not under much, she comes out at one point in this pink silk robe and reveals... I mean, she's, by today's standards, it's very tame. Uh, she just flashes some leg up past the knee, and that's really all you see. All of a sudden, I remembered why classier is better. When she is seducing Bruce Wayne, you really do almost just want uh, her to stop being Catwoman and for them to get together. Yeah. That sequence where they're on their date also has one of my other favorite moments is when Alfred drives the Batmobile mm -hmm. and that his disguise so that people... Because the Batmobile is a convertible <laughs> with the top open. And ba so you don't know Alfred's really Alfred. He he wears a Lone Ranger style mask. Yes, his, his his whole disguise is a domino mask. Yes, the rest, of, the rest of it is just his Alfred outfit. No one would ever be able to figure that out. They also, I liked, they brought back weird little things from the show. Like, I don't know if you noticed the penguin's um, clock. He has a cuckoo clock that's an igloo that a penguin can come out of that you mm. see in the background. It looks like the cheapest prop known to man. That's from, like, his first appearance. And let's see, what were other highlights? Of course... Adam West is basically a god among men. I would describe him as a wry William Shatner. That's a really good description. And I love him. Before, I think before I even ever saw one episode of Batman, I became familiar with Adam West as a joke. Yes. Uh, because, well, I mean, for my generation, he is the mayor. He is Mayor Adam West of Quahog, Rhode Island on Family Guy. And I also, have you ever heard of a little... And it is a terrible movie, so don't feel bad if you haven't heard of it. But have you ever heard of a movie called Omega Cop? No. It's a post-apocalyptic karate actioner starring Ron Marchini. Uh, Not familiar. Yeah, yeah, martial arts superstar Ron Marchini, who once almost won the U.S. Karate Championship. Uh, the guy he lost to in the final, Chuck Norris. Oh, wow. Chuck Norris went on to make a movie with Bruce Lee. What you get in second place is you get to make Omega Cop and a sequel to Omega Cop called Karate Cop. Never watch these movies, by the way. They're, they're Or if you do, don't watch them alone. They're interminable if you watch them alone. But Adam West has, has top billing in Omega Cop. He's a military general who never leaves his bunker. That's it. They had him for one day, maybe two days. They just put him in a bunker and said, say things into a microphone. And that's Adam West. So <laughs> what happened with Adam West is he had a lot of featured roles on television programs and stuff before Batman and appeared in some films like Robinson Crusoe on Mars and some other things. He was an actor who was getting sure. work. And then he got Batman based on being in a Yoohoo commercial where mm. he was kind of both dashing and doing humor for in a family situation. And somebody saw it and was like, hey, that guy would be the good for the Batman show. Mm -hmm. And so he got an audition and he passed that, etc. And then the Batman show was huge. And so he thought, boy, I'm a big star. And then after the Batman show got canceled, he couldn't get work 
at all. Sure. And right. so he's got like scattered roles in the early 80s, few and far between in terrible Z grade movies. Oh, mix up. Yes, exactly. <laughs> well, he had a kind of a sad time throughout the 70s, especially wherein he eventually just started like showing up at mall openings and rodeos as Batman across the country and world, not really being an actor. They had like a special of where he and Burt Ward came back as Batman and dealt with some other DC heroes that you can find on tape. I forget what it's called, like Battle of the Superheroes or something. I've like seen a clip of that, I think. Uh, yeah, it's like a two-part thing. Mm -hmm. And so his career was really bad until the people that grew up on Batman became people who wrote TV. Well, they couldn't really bring him back in a serious fashion. They brought him back on The Family Guy, on Simpsons, mm -hmm. as a guest on Politically Incorrect and on Conan O'Brien. And of course, we just watched Conan O'Brien and Robert Smigel wrote a sitcom that only had a pilot based around Adam West as a struggling former TV star called Look Well. And yeah, so well, his career as a regular actor never came back, at least like he found a lot of happiness. Yeah, I don't think I'd ever heard that story before and that makes me really depressed because I'd always gotten the impression that the transition came much sooner. You know, I don't think Burt Ward ever made it out of that wilderness. He did not. You've never seen any of the Arrowverse TV shows, I imagine. No. That's a rabbit hole you don't need to go down. I've been down it, so I can I can just tell you that periodically, uh, for several seasons, they did crossovers between all the shows. And the biggest one was an adaptation of The Crisis on Infinite Earths oh, uh, wow. storyline from the comics. Yeah, I remember that from the comics when I was a kid. Yeah, uh, the uh, imagine it being done on a budget of about maybe $12 million combined across six TV show episodes. Does that sound good? Eh. The answer is no. <laughs> but Burt Ward showed up in that. As, like as an Silver a, Age Bat Robin. As an adult, yeah, as a very adult Robin, uh, literally for 20 seconds before his universe got wiped out of existence. Oh, wow. So, no, he's never made it out of Robin. And not that I know of, anyway. However, during the run of the show, being a guest star or villain really brought in a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Like, and some, some of them surprising. One of them with the connection to this uh, director is Cliff Robertson. Cliff Robertson. Who played a evil or, or misguided villainous cowboy named Shame <laughs> in Two <laughs> Feet of <laughs> He did not just say shame. Yes. Oh, no. <laughs> other, oh. other villains were the first Mr. Freeze was George Sanders. Oh, seriously? Yes. Like all about Eve, George Sanders. Yes, he only did it in oh. two. Then he was replaced by Otto Priminger. And then, Wait, Otto Priminger, the director? Yes. And then Otto <laughs> Priminger was replaced by Eli Wallach. There were three. Oh. Oh my gosh. Milton Burrow was a villain. Now um, I'm just imagining... Ann Baxter was a season one villain. Now I'm just imagining Eli Wallach from The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly doing Mr. Fruit. In pretty much Good, The Bad, and The Ugly era. Because he's, I think, in yeah. season three, which would be, I think, maybe the same year Good, The Bad, and The Ugly came out. Oh my gosh. How did they get those guys? The show was a hit. Cliff Robertson really is a scratch because it's post PT 109, mm -hmm. which he plays JFK. And it's it's post Charlie, right? No, it's pre Charlie. Pre Charlie, okay. Yeah, so it's one of those things where Cliff Robertson was never an A list star, but starred in movies pretty much throughout his career until he was an older man. Like he's the star of uh, Brian De Palma's Obsession in the mid 70s after yeah. Charlie. Yeah, yeah, I literally just saw Cliff Robertson in a movie two days ago. Spider Man? They played a little clip from his Uncle Ben death scene. Oh, in the in new, the, in the in new, the new Spider Across the Spider Verse oh, wow. movie, yeah. He won Best Actor after being shamed. Well, you know, Forrest Whitaker hosted the second worst adaptation of The Twilight Zone ever, and, and then he won an Oscar for The Last King of Scotland. So, yeah. what are you going to do? That is unbelievable, though. You know, you could be making this up, and I would believe you. There's one uh, person. We didn't bring up, well, I mentioned his name, but William Dozier, the other co-producer, co-creator of the show, he's the voice 
that is the narrator that the same bad time will Robin be cool for good he's also one of my favorite parts of the show and I was happy to see them even though they didn't have commercial breaks employ the narrator in this movie oh Robin was never cool no it was a Mr. Freeze episode I no I picked up on that from the contest I I, I couldn't let that go unchallenged (laughs) The film was shot at Desi Lu Studios and the old Fox lot, which I don't think you can go to either of those now. Oh, that's too bad. The Bat Boat Pier, where the, they have the Bat Boat, is in Rancho Palos Verdes, California. The big location where if you're in the area, you can go in and through and people know are the Bronson Caves. Yep. which is the ex- exit of the Bat Cave where the Batmobile comes out of. Yeah. I am very familiar with Bronson Canyon. Any B-picture lover from the 50s and 60s, or heck, even any Star Trek fan from the original run of the show knows Bronson Canyon. And if you're vacationing in the Hollywood area, you want to go on the Griffith Park hike to go to the Hollywood sign, yeah. you got to do yourself a favor and... Just go through the old back caves of Bronson Caves. There is one uh, one movie that is entirely set in Bronson Canyon, which I will make you watch at some point. Excellent. Fair warning, the only good part of it is the score by Elmer Bernstein. Yeah. So it's not the grifters. No. Another highlight scene I like when Batman's trying to dispose of the bomb and th- that woman goes by with a baby carriage, all the bad places <laughs> he could put with the, put the bombs <laughs> Some days you just can't dispose of a bomb. That particular sequence cycled me through. At first I was laughing a little bit. (laughs) And then I just started to roll my eyes and groan. And then it kept going. And I started laughing again. It brought me around. Yeah. It, it did that. I will say that Batman and Robin take the worst care of their vehicles of all time. The only one that is actually completely under their control is the Batmobile. You know, okay, and fine, okay, the Batcopter is at Van Nuys Airport, uh, locked away under the care of some people. Uh, that one I'll let slide. Uh, the bat That's boat a- is literally <laughs> sitting exposed yes. at the bottom of a pier that's off a public road. Anybody could go and plant a bomb in that thing. Anybody could mess up that. And the bat cycle is disguised. No, it's not. <laughs> it, it is hidden under the least convincing bush I have seen in many a year. It's a, it's a wonder they didn't get themselves blown up. What were some low lights? I was attacked. Two kids tried to set me on fire. Oh my god! No, I'm not alright. I'm hurt, I'm pissed. Gotta find a new job. They're all trying to kill me. I mean, I just wanted to leave. You know, my apartment, maybe meet a nice girl. And now I've gotta die for it? Really? Worst film you ever saw. Well, my next one will be better. Hello? Uh, the Polaris Missile. (laughs) (laughs) If you have a Polaris Missile, or a set of them, actually, and you're trying to take control of the world, let me say, there are many things that Polaris Missiles might be useful in accomplishing. Complicated skywriting is not one of those things. Are the Polaris missiles, I got the impression that they were basically completely under the control of the Riddler. Because he's the one who launches them. Yeah, maybe they were just trying to figure something for him to do. Yeah, because the Penguin has the submarine. Yes, and and uh, Joker has control by land. Yes. At land, he may command, but by sea, sea, it it is is me. me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) <laughs> and, and of course, Catwoman is the is the sex pot, the yes. double agent Thanks. infiltrator. So yeah. What did you think about uh, Lee Merriweather's cat noises? I thought they were perfectly terrible. I thought they were awesome. <laughs> she does the weird cat and heat moaning stuff, and oh. almost there almost seems to be no motivation for it. Yeah, that was where I just started <laughs> feeling bad for her. There was one part where it just creeps out one of the henchmen. Which is like, yeah, 
I was in sympathy with the henchmen. <laughs> that was that would have been very uncomfortable. So I'm guessing that the Polaris missiles were under the control of the Riddler anyway. What he about fires off that? several of them. The the part where I really just started rolling my eyes and never quite stopped was when Batman said, "Look, it's left something written in the sky," and I'm like, "Okay, like a few words," and then it's basically the first paragraph of something. It's it's two full riddles, oh, when they which launched, collectively are like 40 words. When they launch the Polaris missile, and Robin's like, Holy Polaris, Batman! It looks like stock footage, and it's a different grain of footage. Oh, it is the, absolutely yeah. stock footage, and they couldn't afford to film a Polaris missile yeah. launch for this. Or a model of one? No. Oh, no. They have other models. They have, they have that actually... Pretty decent submarine. Line. Yes, the penguin submarine is pretty fun. Although those flippers. Yes, I liked them. Oh, uh, what about uh, that sequence where they were shooting the the torpedoes at Batman and Robin when they were magnetized that buoy, and Batman gets out that transponder or whatever to try to re- reverse the polarity, and then the penguin figures out what he's doing. It's like ah, he must be using some kind of transponder to reverse energy fields. But- that, that is not a sentence that should make sense in the English language. I don't know. If I fired one torpedo at Batman and Robin and it blew up before it hit the target, I might try a second time. I definitely wouldn't try a third. At that point, you're just wasting a good torpedo. You now, we did also get one of the other staples of the show, the onomatopoeia fighting. Yeah. A lot of good watery ones. I, and they made us wait for that, too. I was really expecting did. it much earlier on, but... Uh, it doesn't come in until, like, the last 15 minutes. No. There's also the crazy, um, not quite onomatopoeia, but similar weird animation when they hit, hit, rock the uh, penguin's boat. Whatever they hit it with makes contact. And there's, like, those, like, shock waves of animation. Yes. That was pretty groovy. <laughs> I think that if, if there's a low light, and I'm saying if. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> That it's maybe the climax of the movie at the United World Building. Oh, that is a really weird note to end the movie on. I don't want to. I I don't think we could go into that without doing spoilers. No. But there's I know. one funny bit when the day is saved, basically. But other than that, it's just kind of a weak climax. Yeah, there's there's if the funny bit you're talking about is the one I think you're talking about. I agree. And the arguing? It, oh, then no. Oh, I thought that was funny. <laughs> uh, well, let me just say, I didn't I didn't think what happened afterward was funny. It's, uh, this is what you did, guys. <laughs> Why not stay around and fix it? Uh, yeah. and, and that's all I can say without defeating the purpose. I, I'm, I'm coming off on the movie more harsh than I mean to. Um, One crazy thing is when... Yeah. All the villains are rounded up in that uh, onomatopoeia fight, and it's not clear how they rounded them up or anything. It's just like, oh, I guess. Oh, no, I have no idea. Yeah. It's, and I don't think the fight choreographers had any idea no, either. They were just like, eh, all right, yeah. this will be a joke. Yes. Yeah, the, the fight choreography for this, by the way, was clearly done by the people who did uh, fight choreography for the first season of Iron Fist. <laughs> I haven't seen it. It's It's that bad. <laughs> it's pretty bad. It's but it's but it's mid I mean it's campy. It's that's not a like I said, I'm coming off harsher on this than I than I probably mean to. It's bright and it's colorful, which are two qualities I don't associate with Batman and the media where I normally watch Batman, but it's relatively inoffensive and it's not two hours. It's right. a little longer than I remembered. It's like an hour 40 or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I, I thought it was going to be yeah. like 90 minutes. Yeah, the one I got was an hour 45. Mm. And it's not an it's not an unpleasant way to pass 100 minutes, you know? No, certainly not. <laughs> the, who stole the movie to you? If you had the chance, unemployed now, to walk away with a half million dollars, would you take it? That's what we need to do. Rob a bank. We need to take it intact from several men who will be intent on preventing us. Stopwatch. Check. Pocket laser. Check. Infrared reflex. Check. Portable detonator. Check. Whoopee cushion. I think it's in the bus. I do what I do best. I take scores. You do what you do best. Trying to stop guys like me. 
No, we think that you lose. Lee Merriweather. I agree. She's so good that I wish she was always Catwoman. Yeah. Although, I have seen one of the Julie Newmar episodes. I've never seen any of the Eartha Kit ones. I liked her as Catwoman, Julie Newmar. I mean, I understand why she's associated with it. Too Wong Fu. Thanks for everything. <laughs> I also like this interpretation. It never occurred to me that Lee Merriweather and Julie Newmar weren't the same person when I was a child. Mm -hmm. It was just, it just flowed one into the other to me. Although I will say a runner-up, I mean, Burgess Meredith is pretty great. He gets so little credit for being a good actor. He's like, you could make a regular Batman movie and have him be the pink one. And it wouldn't be embarrassing. No. No. He, he would do an okay job with that, I think. Frank Gorshin is very much in the vein of Jim Carrey. Jim Carrey's kind of the perfect Riddler to follow on the heels of Frank Gorshin if you're going for that. I don't, I think that's an insult to Frank Gorshin. I remember Jim Carrey's performance in Batman Forever vividly as the moment when I stopped liking Jim Carrey even a little bit. But they're both similar, like, they're so thin that, and amped up that they seem like they're on amphetamines. Mm -hmm. But my impression is Frank Gorshin was trying his best to do something real. I could be wrong. I'm just no, spitballing right. here. Like, he was trying his best to create the most villainous character he could within the confines of what was clearly meant to be a family-friendly comedy adventure thing. And Jim Carrey was trying to find new and exciting ways to hurt my brain. Let's let's go through the, the major. Madge Blake, Stafford Rep, Alan Napier, Neil Hamilton, Burt Ward, Adam West. I'm going to say this is the high point of all of their careers. Well, yeah, certainly Adam West and Burt Ward. I don't think there's any. I mean, anything that Adam West did after this that had any significant value was because of when it comes to Batman, the, the villains have always been where it's at anyway, right? I mean, Michael Keaton took a backseat to Jack Nicholson and Danny DeVito and Michelle Pfeiffer. Arguably, Christian Bale took a backseat at least to Heath Ledger. Sure. Batman is, is the moral center of his movies often, but he's never really the star. What about um, Lee Merriweather? Uh, you know... I'm going to say this is her top thing, too. It just Catwoman in general? This movie, especially. I mean, she only did two episodes of the show. Yeah, uh, I have seen her in one other thing that I'd like to name check. Uh, she, she did a lot of TV. Uh, and she was in a late-run episode of the original Star Trek series, uh, where she played the long dead commander of an alien outpost who's oh, wow. hunting the crew of the Enterprise because she thinks they're they're attacking her planet. That's the only other thing I'm aware of having seen her in. I saw her recently in a movie called The Undefeated where she plays John Wayne's love interest. Really? Yes, and then she was brought back in maybe John Wayne's next movie, Chisholm, as a still frame in a locket he carries as a different character of his dead wife or something. More notably, I think, more than the movie The Undefeated, which is pretty damned mediocre. Like, last month I read the novelization of the movie, which was adapted by Jim Thompson. It still wasn't too great, but it was better than the movie. That was, that's probably the only other thing I've seen Lee Merriweather in that I can recall. Yeah, so, so it's going to be this. Then what about Frank Gorshin? What about Frank Gorshin? He's I mean, in the movie 12 Monkeys, which is a great, great movie. Better movie than this. But he's barely yeah. in it. Like, he's blinking and you'll miss yeah, it. Yeah, that's not, that's not quite fair. I don't know that I've ever seen him. I'm sure I've We seen saw him, him in The Great Imposter. Oh, what was he in The Great Imposter? He's Barney right? the Prisoner. Oh, that's right. Okay. Which is probably also a better movie than this, maybe. Yeah, but I, I think he's giving a more committed performance here. Oh, he was pretty committed in uh, he was. The Great Imposter. But yes, I'm still going to go with being the Riddler in this as, as a bigger deal. Then we get to Cesar Romero, who had an, quite the extensive film career and TV career. Yeah, mostly I'm familiar with him from his TV work. He was the Cisco Kid, if you've ever heard of the Cisco yes, Kid. Yes, I have. Then he was also in the movie uh, Veracruz with Burt Lancaster. 
Master who was in I've Rising never Dark seen Cruise. that. That's a decent Western. And I wonder, here's something as a non-old school Batman reader. Okay. I wonder if the Joker's costume on the TV show and movie Batman isn't in some way westernized to meet the expectation of Cesar Romero's persona. Hmm. The Joker's tie is like a shoestring tie. Yeah. And then he has those weird tails and stripes. There's something Old Westy about the Joker on the Batman TV show and Mm -hmm. in this movie. And I don't know if that's a nod to Cesar Romero's persona in people's minds when he got the role or not. It could be. But I'm maybe, maybe it's being the Cisco kid, but I might also have to say this might be Cesar Romero's high point as a, as a film actor too. (laughs) We are really, uh, we are really saying, oh, they had lots of other things that they did, but this was the best thing. Yeah. What about Burgess Meredith though? Oh, well, I mean, clearly the best thing for Burgess Meredith is those five episodes of The Twilight Zone. (laughs) But he was also in three Rocky films. Wait, he was in Rocky? Okay, I'm sorry, I'll stop. And he Um, was in the Grumpy Old Men films. He was in Beloved by Some film, Dave the Locust. To me... The high point for Burgess Meredith, the 1939 of Mice and Men, where he's George. Yes, I can see that. Uh, For me, of course, he will always be, always be Mickey. Mickey. Uh, Although, I will say, it's, and this is not quite maybe fair to him, but uh, even before I remember him as Mickey, I wasn't joking about those Twilight Zone episodes. He's, no, in, I, I, he's in a couple of my all-time favorites. Yes, you're right. He is like one of the classic old-school Twilight Zone actors. Yep, and uh, I, I think he was in five, and uh, the the one, one of the very best, one of the gut-punchiest of them, uh, the one where he plays a, a mild-mannered, miserable mm-hmm. bank teller who gets trapped mm-hmm. in a safe uh, yes. during the end of the world atomic you blast. can finally read all those books yeah we won't spoil the ending but uh, it's a it's a real it's one of the punch. most famous twilight zones yeah having worn glasses when i was a kid that one that one has stuck with me as that that's the unkindest cut of all but you know he was uh, twice nominated for the academy award for best supporting actor including of course for rocky uh, in a year where what he, was his other nomination? Uh, the Day of the Locust, oh. which you yeah. Uh, but I think he probably should have won for Rocky because he is actually the heart of that film, and he makes it work. Maybe even more than Sylvester Stallone does. I mean, I don't have anything against Jason Robards, but giving it to him for all the President's Men in a movie that's really owned by Robert Redford and Dustin Hoffman. I, I, I just God. don't think it's right. Hal Holbrook. He's in State of Grace. Oh, man, he was Globulus in G.I. Joe the movie. The, <laughs> the animated movie that did not come out at theaters, mm. but was meant to, I believe. Yep, he was in Skidoo. Oh, I've never seen that. Oh, true Speaking con- of auto like good and True Confessions. You've never seen Skidoo? No, is that good? No. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I saw it only once. I was sick. And Skidoo made me pray for the release of death. That's crazy. Because I saw it while I was sick. It is a movie that you say something like, and, and this, this actually makes sense within the context of Skidoo, is that at the end of the movie, a bunch of freedom fighters led by Carol Channing, dressed like a burlesque George Washington, invade the floating yacht of God, as played by Groucho Marx, while Jackie Gleason floats overhead in a makeshift hot air balloon that's sewn together out of prison uniforms, high as a kite. That is the kind of movie Skidoo is. Good cast. Uh, yeah, Frankie Avalon's in it. It's an Otto Preminger film. An Otto Preminger joint, as the kids would say. Bird that Smith must have been what Jackie Gleason was smoking. I'm just now putting that together. Very stony movie, 92 in the Shade, that is about fishermen in Florida with, Ooh, with uh, okay. have a um, war, and it's with Peter Fonda, Warren Oates, Margot Kidder, Harry Dean Stanton, Burgess Meredith, Sylvia Miles, William Hickey, Joe Spinell. Okay. Burgess Meredith himself, I think, might have been kind of an odd 
even though he was an older, hippie-ish character. He was known to give money and hang out with Dr. John Lilly. Are you familiar with Dr. John Lilly? Mm-mm. Dr. John Lilly ran a thing called Echo Lab, where he dealt a lot with dolphins. Okay. And he also liked to take a lot of LSD and ketamine and put himself in um, oh, what are the uh, sensory deprivation tanks. In these sensory deprivation tanks, things would come to him and he would speak with cetacean aliens who were here on Earth before us and became convinced whales and dolphins and things were the master race. It's pretty out there. And in fact, two movies and a video game were based on the work of John Lilly. There was the 70s film Day of the Dolphin, mm-hmm. which starred maybe Jason Robot. No, George C. Scott more or less as a John Lilly kind of character. Okay. And then there was the first film with William Hurt, Altered States. Yep, which, which I have seen, and uh, it's not even among Ken Russell's weirdest, I No, think. which is odd. <laughs> yeah, dude. We mentioned The Devils last time. That's mm-hmm. even weirder for sure. Then recently I watched um, Listomania, which ha- featured uh, machine gun guitar toting Hitler Frankenstein. You, I uh, I have seen Listomania. I saw it in the same place I saw Skidoo. Uh, different years, but <laughs> same place. Sick? No. Same auditorium, same event, different place. That's a bee fest in Chicago. Yeah, at least Domania is pretty crazy. Yes, yes, it, it it certainly was. I got to say, the audience it, did not receive Listomania very well. <laughs> the Sega Genesis game Echo the Dolphin also owes a nod to the Echo Labs of John Lilly. So yeah, we can say Burgess Meredith is the one cast member that this is not his highlight. <laughs> Although we didn't look at um, Sir Reginald Denny or whatever, who was in Rebecca, among other things. Yeah. So Leslie Martinson. Director. I'm thinking that PT-109 is probably his highlight. Yeah, he mostly seems to have done TV, doesn't he? Yeah, he had a few family films, I think, in the 70s. Though he did one episode of Buck Rogers in the 25th century, Mm -hmm. The Cosmic Whiz Kid. Oh, you know who played The Cosmic Whiz Kid? I do not. Gary Coleman. (laughs) The smartest kid in the universe. Oh, no. I will say this for Leslie Martinson, died at the age of 101. Wow. Yeah, and not too long ago, I mean, cosmically speaking, uh, 2016. So he had a good long life and seems to have done a lot of TV, and I hope it paid his bills and made him happy. He directed two episodes of the show, The Manhunter, from the 70s, which is about a Depression-era bounty hunter. Hmm. Which I've no, come only recently learned existed because on podcast that Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery do, mm-hmm. they've been doing these um, tributes to the dead Rick Dalton, and they pretend like Rick Dalton starred on that TV show and describe episodes as if. Oh, that makes if, sense. Is that where the whole Rick Dalton died thing came from? They made a thing where he died, and now they're making like podcasts where. Okay. They make up fake movies and TV shows and things and discuss them as if Rick Dalton had done them. Oh, he did 18 episodes of Maverick. Yeah, <laughs> one of my mom's all-time favorites. And having seen a couple episodes, that's that's justifiable. Yeah. Pretty cute western. And then we get to the writers, William Dozier, or the uh, producer slash writer William Dozier. And uh, Lorenzo Simple Jr. I'm going to go with Lorenzo Simple Jr.'s thing being Three Days of the Condor. Yeah. Even though he has many, many big credits. Flash Gordon, the movie. He wrote the screenplay for Papillon. That's pretty good. Three Days of the Condor, Papillon, The Parallax View, The Drowning Pool, Marriage of a Young Stockbroker. Then a lot of TV before that. So for, uh, for William Dozier, it's got to be this. It better be. No, I'm, I'm pretty sure it is, because he did create Batgirl. Oh, wow. Or co-create Batgirl for the TV show. Yeah, nothing else really seems like it compared. No, I mean, and, and Batgirl has gone on to have, you know, a 50-plus year legacy in the comics and in all of the ancillary media. And, of course, Barbara Gordon is the subject for one of the great all-time DC one-shots, and one of the very few comic books that I can 
confidently say I have read The Killing mm. Joke. Oh. Oh, is that where she gets, does she get killed or does Robin get killed? She doesn't get killed. Uh, you're, you're, uh, you're thinking of a death in the family with Robin. Okay. Uh, no, uh, The Killing Joke is where she gets paralyzed. Oh, wow. Uh, because the Joker shoots her through the spine. Oh, a couple of other notes. Hmm? The Benedict Arnold Monument... I noticed that. <laughs> Gotham has a Benedict Arnold monument. Maybe he was a native son. <laughs> you know, he was a, a, an American hero right up until the point he wasn't. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which not a lot of people today really understand or appreciate. I liked when Batman told the police that that uh, boat was filled with human jetsam. <laughs> he did. Oh, it must have been so much fun to rate this movie, though. And when they are doing, I think at least twice in this movie, we get the classic gag of when they walk up walls of buildings with the mm-hmm. rope. And I've, the one I've with, seen the YouTube supercut of all of the times from the show that they do that, including one when they run into Colonel Clink from Hogan's well, Heroes. That, that became a thing as the show wore on, where you would have sort of a guest performer that is either probably plugging something else on the network or it's just some Mm -hmm. other guest star that just pops out of the window. But in this movie, it appears to just be a character like it was in the beginning, like some random person pops out, a drunkard. Batman reminds Robin that they they may be drinkers, but they're still human beings. I didn't realize Batman was a card-carrying member of the Temperance Union. Yeah, oh yeah, no. (laughs) When, I mean, in the one you saw, when he goes to that bar, he orders orange juice. Sure. You know, Batman would never take any kind of substance or anything that might impair his ability to be aware and fight crime. Oh, of course not. Nothing that would addle him. Yeah, it certainly has nothing to do with keeping your show family friendly and, and, and pleasing the people who never touch a drop of the hard stuff. That's right. No, it's totally within Batman's character to not drink. Yes. He's led such a bright and sunny life. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's, uh, I will probably never revisit this, but I am glad I watched it. I'm glad you did, too. Yeah. It was, like I said, a a relatively unobjectionable way to spend an afternoon. And And it's the first one of these we've done of the L.A. movies that one of us hasn't seen before. That's true. Um, I promise there will be more. Oh, and, and, and from me as well. Yeah, definitely. I've got to set this one up. I will say that uh, much like Colors, we're taking a side trip to Venice. Much like this movie... The part of Venice that we see is standing in for something else. It is is not what it's supposed to be. All I'm going to say is some bad things happen, and Charlton wants you to know that nothing would have happened if we just built that wall. If we say, tune in next week, same bad time, same bad channel, are we violating copyright? No. I'm still not going to do it. I was just curious. (laughs) So, until next episode, I'm Mason. And I'm Matt, old chums. And uh, join us for the next episode of LA Movies, where we look at the City of Angels from another angle. Yeah, man.